finishing up one of my mini takes. <laughs> Just a second. Wonderful Tuesday evening. I know we normally do shows on, on Thursday nights, but uh, my wife has got a uh, she's got to work Thursday night, so it'd be kind of hard to shoot a video back here with my three year old. Um, I'm pretty sure it'd be interesting, but um, so I figured I'd do it tonight. It's been a while since we've done a video. Um, been busy, been real, real, real busy. Uh, the season is upon us, and it uh, looks like it's going to be a good one. Um, uh, we're real busy with engines, real busy with cars, with parts. Um, I've done a little racing. Um, it, it's hard to hard to work these videos in. You know, I'm I'm behind on dyno work, behind on engine work, behind on everything. I guess that's a good thing, good problem to have. But um, you know, but it's been a while. I figured I'd do a little short video for. All my videos start out to be short, <laughs> usually never are. But um, anyway, tonight, what I'd like to do is just kind of go over a, a few things that um, you can do to uh, help maintain your engine, you know, a after you race. Um, you know, some people don't race every single Saturday night. Um, some people race every few weeks, and not everybody has a climate control building to put their stuff in, and that can cause a problem with some of this fuel and stuff that we use. I'll uh, show you how to how to not really winterize things because winter is over; it's racing season. Um, but just how to how to maintain things so that you have less problems when you get ready to go to the track the next weekend or the next or whenever you race. Uh, just simple things you can do to um, this this fuel that we use is this this you know, the pump gasoline that most of the clones use and a lot of the modifieds use also. It's just an, an, an awful gas for, for what these little carburetors that we use them in. And like I said before, not everybody has climate control buildings to put their stuff in. And what I mean by that is a lot of people, including myself, um, here at my house, uh, my stuff, when I bring it home, sits down there in my barn, you know, and this time of the year it can be 80 plus degrees. Like today I think it was 83 here, and tonight it can get down into the mid-50s. That's a very big... Um, temperature change from day to night and the moisture comes in and and with this fuel that we got the longer it sits the more it the more it separates the ethanol and the gasoline will actually try to separate I mean it's not a day or two it takes you know a couple of weeks um, but the stuff sitting up the ethanol can become corrosive and you know start messing with the carburetor start messing with rubber o-rings um, start leaving you know sludge and um, you know, gum deposits behind that will stop up your carburetor when you go to try to fire it up the next next time you race. Um, but um, the simplest thing to do with this is, is no secret. It's, it's you know not some ancient Chinese remedy. Um, basic WD-40. Uh oh, the screen's backwards here. Turn it around that way. Now can you read it? Anyway, WD-40. I use this in every carburetor, no matter what fuel that we run. I use this to clean out the carburetor. Simple as pie. Basic clone carburetor. This is just a bone stock carburetor I got off the shelf today. Um, after you get done racing, uh, before you load up, um, you might, and you can even do this the next day. You ain't got to do this at the track. You can do it the next day, you know, or the next. As long as you do it within a couple of days of after you race, everything's fine. Simple. You just remove, there's two bowls on the carburetor. You got what I call the little reservoir bowl below the on-off switch and the main bowl, which is where the jet's at. You just take your 10 millimeter wrench or socket, if you can find them, and just take the bowl off, dump the fuel out into a container. Don't dump it on the ground. All right? Dump it into a container for proper disposal. Take the bowl off, same thing. Let the fuel drain out into a container. Uh, once they're empty, take your WD-40. Just kind of spray around inside the bowl just a little bit. Spray around inside the bowl in this one just a little bit. Um, you can spray up into the carburetor if you want to because there's you know rubber O-rings 
that this WD-40 can get on and, and help them stay soft and spongy and, and work like they're supposed to so they don't dry rot. You know, spray a little bit up there on it, put your bowls back on. Don't forget to, you know, tighten them up. So the fuel leak, especially gasoline, is not good on these little engines. Take a 10 millimeter, tighten everything back up. Then you want to take the air filter off of it. And when you do, when you look in the front of the car, I'll actually use the needle on this. You got a brass insert right there, and you got a little brass insert hole right there. Simple. You just take WD-40 with your nozzle, put inside the brass insert, match the button. You'll see WD-40 squirt out in the back of the carburetor, or on this side, you'll see it come up through the E-tube. And as soon as you see it spray off in the carburetor, you're done. Just that simple. And what that does, when you this side right here, of course, works the low speed. And... The, I might get this out with my fingers, I don't know, I don't have nothing here. Of all the time I need a screwdriver in here, I ain't got one. For those of you that don't know, that you can take a low speed jet out with a <laughs> rocker arm. <laughs> the low speed jet has rubber O-rings on it also. Most of them do. Some people's carburetors it's according to how they build them, they may remove this bottom O-ring on it, you know, according to how it's built. 99.9% .9 of our carburetors, well, I take that back, probably 80% of them will have the O-ring on the bottom. And when you spray the WD-40 through the, the side that feeds the load, WD-40 gets on these O-rings. And it helps keep them soft and helps keep them sealing like they're supposed to, and they'll last a lot longer. Um, I've seen people that, you know, maintain their stuff pretty well, but they don't spray in here and those O-rings will dry out and eventually get, you know, break off and stop up some of the carburetor. And then when that happens, that stops up these little bitty holes, the little welch plug holes in there behind the plug, and sometimes that can be a pain to clean out. Um, but this WD-40 and these little carburetors, that's all you got to do. Drain the bowls, spray some up in it, brass on the left, Brass on the right, um, and you're done. Now, if you want to, sometimes I'll take the hose that comes from the tank up to the fuel pump and squirt WD-40 up into the fuel pump to kind of lubricate the fuel pump and keep it from drying out, and that tends to help the life of the pump. Um, methanol. If you're running methanol, doing this is a must. Um, the ethanol in the gasoline is one thing. That takes a few days um, but it helps to spray WD-40 to keep everything, all the rubber O-rings lube. Now, methanol, I've seen it corrode as fast as seven days, depending on how the weather, especially in the wintertime, when it stays wet and the air is always wet and it's heavy, it will create, what happens is that methanol dries up and it leaves a powder residue behind. And that powder residue clogs up everything. But doing this with WD-40, um, as soon as you see it, Come out and it's good. That's all you got to do. It's just that simple. Um, as I say in every video, this is not rocket science. But um, um, racing gas, it, it's got it's got most most racing gas you buy has got lead in it. Um, it doesn't dry out as fast, um, but it still can cause problems with O-rings and stuff. Um, there's no no ethanol in it. Most of it's you know got lead, but it still helps even if you're running racing gas to, to do this, because like I say, those rubber O-rings will get, um, will stay, you know, soft and, and sealing off like they're supposed to. Now, oxygenated racing gas, it's, sometimes I run that. I've got some engines that we run that in. Um, it, it'll eat rubber. That, that's some of the stuff we use is, is pretty bad. It actually, you know, a fuel pump, you're lucky if you get two races out of it. Even doing the WD-40, you know, it'll, it'll, it just eats that rubber up. It's some pretty bad stuff. But um, any fuel you use, just coat it down. You know, the WD-40 is not going to hurt nothing. WD-40 is somewhat combustible, and um, it's not going to hurt nothing. It'll mix with the gas. Next time you get ready to, to go racing, you just reprime your carburetor, get fuel to it, fire it up, you're ready to go. Um, now, for y'all modified guys that run Tillistons, which... You know, this is part of the Tillerson. I just this is a little 334 I grabbed off the shelf where I came just to have a Tillerson with me. 
Um, of course, it ain't got all the stuff on, but this is just the main part of the carburetor. What I do with it is a little different, um, but I still use WD-40. Because uh, most of the time, you're running methanol on these carburetors. So if you're running methanol, gas, race gas, whatever, you still need to clean it. What I do is the line that goes to the pump, I remove that line and, you know, till it down and drain out any excess fuel into a container, not on the ground. And once it's drained out, I hold the line up. Take my WD-40, stick it in the top, fill the line up, you know. It, it'll kind of bubble up. You may have to go slow with it, but fill it up. Then, with the spark plug still in the engine, I take the electric starter, and I spin the engine. Sometimes you may have to open the throttle a little bit, but I spin the engine, and when you do that, you'll see this go right on down. And what that's doing, that's sucking the WD-40 with the raw fuel that's in it, but a little bit. There's not much fuel in, in a Tilston. There's very, very little. Um, it ain't like it's got a big bowl and it's going to wash down the cylinder. There's very, very little fuel in here. It'll pull that through. Um, into the cylinder and out the exhaust. Um, but that coats everything as it goes down. All these diaphragms and, and you know, there's rubber stuff in here, rubber O-rings, and it goes completely through the carburetor and into the cylinder. I always do it twice. I fill it up, turn my starter, watch it go down, then I fill it up again, turn my starter, and watch it go down. And you're killing two birds, especially with methanol. You're cleaning the carburetor, you're lubing up everything, and that WD-40 is lubing the cylinder because um, methanol is a very, very dry fuel. And sometimes when it sits up for a week or so, there's no oil at all if everything is sealed good on your rings on the top of the cylinder. And this, the WD-40, we spray it through here, it sucks into the engine, it coats everything down, and keeps things from rusting up so that when you get ready to go racing again, you don't have problems. That's one of the main problems with these Tillerson carburetors is people, um, you know, not make, they're letting the methanol stay in them too long, and or they never clean them. I know some people say, oh, I ain't never cleaned one. You're lucky. Um, I clean them, and, you know, because of me pulling the hoses off, I'd get a little piece or something on it and, you know, have a small problem at the track. Um, another thing you can do, if you remember to count how many turns these are in, you know, here's your low speed and your, and your high speed adjustment on Tilson. This is how you adjust it. Always count how many times it goes in and bottom it out. You turn it in, you tighten it up. You know, this one on the back, the high side, that's a half turn. That's one turn. Bottom's out, one turn. All right, you know it's one turn. Then you can take the screw all the way out and hold on to it because there's a spring on the end of it and sometimes a little rubber washer like that. See a little rubber washer on it? And then you could take your WD-40 and squirt directly into the hole, and it'll come out inside the carburetor. Then put your screw back in, or your adjustment needle, not screw. Bottom it all the way out. You don't want to hit it hard just until you feel it hit, and then go back to where you was at. It was set at one turn. So you go half, one. And do the same thing with the front. That'll clean out everything, plus lubricate your little rubber washers in there, and should give you a, a fairly problem-free Tilliston. Um, now, when you go back to firing one of these up, when you plumb it up, especially on methanol, it may it may be a little hard to crank, or it may run a little funny till all the WD-40 gets out of it, but having it run a little funny when it first gets there is a lot better than having problems on the track. You know, you see people all the time that they're constantly turning these things. They're back there adjusting them, adjusting them. Either they got the wrong style of carburetor on their engine, they're running the wrong fuel through that carburetor because Tillerson's, you know, the way that they're drilled and all, they're drilled a little different for gas than they are for methanol. Same thing for a flathead Tillerson on a on a on a overhead valve. Um, they either got the wrong fuel in it, the wrong carburetor on it, or they don't clean it and it stays gummed up and sometimes it takes half the night to, to clean out. Uh, sometimes it never does, and then, you know, you hear people cussing about these old Tillersons, they ain't worth a crap, but this right here will solve a lot of that problem, a lot. I've been doing this for the W40s for years and years, and there are a lot of people that, that do the same thing and been doing it for years. Some people crank it up on W40. I don't like an engine that's, that's especially with a, a big Tillerson, you know, these, these big outlaw and modified engines we run. If it's, if it's set up for gasoline, you got a lot of time in that engine, 
and when it goes from the methanol to the gasoline, sometimes, you know, unless you run high octane gas in it, you know, you'll get, you know, detonation or pre-ignition, which is the gasoline blowing up, you know, before it needs to, and it's really rough on the rod bearing. Even though it runs for just a second, I just, I don't like cranking them up on the fuel that's not designed for it. Some people do it and don't have problems with it. That's good. I'm proud for you. I've just never liked doing that. I've always done this, never had a problem. I do this on my 390s, um, everything. Um, it's always worked, and until it don't work consistently, I'm going to keep doing it. All right, um, that kind of covers carburation. Quick, easy, simple, just like me. Something else you need to check on carburetors, like, you know, your box stock carburetors and stuff. You know, it don't hurt. You ain't got to do it every race, you know, but every couple of races or whatever, take the carburetor off and inspect this. This is what's called the, the insulator or the plastic isolator or that old black piece. People call it a bunch of different stuff, but sometimes these things can crack. There's several different styles of these, and they're, several, and they're made from different plastics. You know, some of them are you can just about break with your fingers, and some of them you about can't drill through. Um, but they'll sometimes because of heat and distortion and stuff like that and vibrations, they'll crack in this little channel here. And sometimes people having engine problems, you know, they, it, all of a sudden the engine, you know, they think the carburetor stopped up and they're changing carburetors and this, that, and the other and can't figure out what's wrong with their engine. And a lot of times it's this. It's cracked. And you, know, you can take them and, and kind of don't try to break it, but just kind of flex it around in the light. And if it's cracked, you'll be able to see it. Or if it's cracked enough, it'll come right apart. But check this every once in a while. You know, a lot of people over tighten carburetors. You, you ain't to, you tighten them screws down on the air filter adapter. You ain't got to put a, a cheater bar on it and pull it. You know, just get them good and tight and snug, and check them after the engine warms up because gaskets, you know, they tend to to uh, compress a little bit. But a lot of problems right here with these things that you know can be solved with just bi-weekly or once a month, you know, inspections of it. Air filters. These things here save or kill more engines a year than probably anything else you can do. A lot of people buy good air filters and never oil them, or they'll use WD-40 on them. WD-40 is not an air filter oil. It will evaporate at about, I'm wanting to say, 110 degrees. You know, typically on a Saturday afternoon in July here in South Georgia, it's 100 and 102 degrees, so you're right at the evaporation point when you spray that on it. You need to get actual K&N or Klotz filter oil. It's designed for air filters. Um, lightly coated. You're not painting the wall. You know, you're not you know, Krylon spray painting, you know, a fixture to go on the bottom of your truck. You just want to lightly haze it. You just want to barely see it change colors. Let it dry. Um, I use these... These are Chinese filters. They're copies of K&N. They're like eight, nine bucks from us. I use these every Saturday night. And never had a problem with them. As long as you clean them properly. That's where other people mess up sometimes. You can use soap and water. I use Simple Green on it. I've even used FTS and TrackTac tire cleaner on it. That cleans them pretty good. Just spray it on it and rinse it off with, you know, a regular, not a high-pressure water hose, but like the water coming out of your sink or out of your shop, whatever, the faucet. It's plenty, and I don't I don't blow them out. You know, I'll take them upside down and sling them. You know, get the water out of it, and I'll set them out there in the sun and let them dry. If you use an air hose to blow the water or the dirt out of these things, you got to use very very low pressure. Um, Forty pounds will blow the cotton out of them. You may not notice it that much, but you, you know, it, it'll open the holes up on it a little bigger than they need to be, and that oil won't create a film over it, and dirt goes in. That's that's a, a big, big problem. I've seen people at the racetrack with you know, an 80-pound air hose. I mean, you can, you can blow somebody over with it sometimes. And they're blowing these air hoses, these air filters out, and I literally see fibers coming off of it. They're sitting there talking to somebody and blowing them out. Then they put them on their engine. After the race, they pull it off, and, man, these Chinese filters ain't worth a toot. Well, you blew it all away with the air hose, you know. That's why I don't like blowing them out. You know, I'll... I'll Use degreaser, simple green. Like I said, I've used tire cleaner on it. Spray it down, and I, you know, typically just use my hand and just kind of, you know, wash. I spray the inside of it, 
and I use hot water coming out the sink. Not really boiling hot water, but you know, good warm water. Let it run on the inside, and that'll push the stuff out of it. And then I just take it when I get done cleaning it, sling it, and get all the excess water off of it, and set it on a pole outside and let them dry in the sun. I've used them many, many, many times like that. They may look stained, but that's just a stain. That's not still dirty. You know, that's that's a cotton, just like your t-shirt. It'll it'll stain. But um. I don't like blowing these out. If you do, use very, very light air and hold it way back and don't hold it in one place long. And these will give you no problem. Um, I like putting the oil on mine. You know, I let them sit out there in the sun. Usually, I have my filters oiled and ready to go Thursday or Friday. I don't really like doing it at the track because that, that oil has to get in the fiber and absorb into it. And sometimes at the track, it don't absorb in quick enough, and you put it on there, and you'll see oil on people's tires. It, it'll run down and run off. I've never really had a problem with it. It just kind of makes a mess. That's why I usually do mine Thursday or Friday, so I've got four or five sitting up there on the thing. I can change filters throughout the night, and that's what's been working for me. Uh, also, weekly maintenance. You know, after a race, during the next week, um, check your lash, especially on these. You can't hear me. Can y'all hear me? Somebody just popped up and said they can't hear me. Type if you can hear me. Nobody said nothing, so I'm not sure. Anyway, um, check your lash on your box stocks, your modifieds, whatever you run. Um, because you remember the video I done. A few videos ago about you know lapping these in you know this one here has been lapped in actually it's been run a little bit um, but even though you lap them in these things sit and wear in one place you know the things are turning and turning and um you need to just check your lash after after every weekend you got to check it at the track you got it set right at the track it'll be good all race just you know sometime during the next week just take them off make see how much they wobble first and then if you got too much you know, close your lash up, reset it. You shouldn't, want, if all this is done right, you shouldn't have to set your lash every single week, but it don't hurt to check it. Um, make sure everything's going good. Um, that's kind of self line for you. Valve springs. What you do every time your engine is fired up when you shut it off dictates how long these last. These are a uh, I think this is a set of the HDs that we got or whatever. Um, anytime you fire the engine up, I say this all the time, and the paperwork goes out with all of our um, all of our engines and stuff like that. That anytime you fire this engine up, it's using the 10.8 springs. Now I'm not really talking about the 26s and the dual. I'm talking about box stocks that's using the 10.8s. Anytime you fire the engine up, whether it's for five minutes in your shop or for 50 laps at a racetrack, when you shut it off. Rotate the engine around to the compression stroke. The reason for that is, and I've said this in other videos and stuff, the head temperatures, it's, it's more important to do when you come off the track from racing than it is in the shop, but either way, if you stop the engine and this spring is collapsed and it sits like that and you shut it off, at your, you cranked it up on a Monday night and you shut it off, that thing's compressed like that all week long. It's going to lose tension at a racetrack. When you come off the track, your head temperature is 4, 425, 450 plus for some engine. Um, you shut it off, that spring is collapsed. And when it's collapsed, it's hot. It's just as hot as what your temperature on your head gauge says because you're measuring the head temperature. And that thing's 400 degrees or right here at it. You compress it, it's going to lose tension at the track within 4 or 5 minutes. You've lost a pound, pound and a half, if not more. Um, so... Rotate the engine around until the, to the compression stroke. Uh, you know you'll feel the what I call it when you pull pull on the rope. It'll be easy. It'll get hard. It'll do the fall on the whole thing. That's right past the compression release. That's where you need to stop it. Um, and what that does is that releases tension on the spring and lets them cool in a more relaxed position. It's not completely unsprung, but it's sitting in there. You know it's not pushed down and compressed, and your springs will last longer that way. Um, it, 
it, it, we used to do this way back in the, I got this from the flathead days. You know, everybody on the, when we used to run flatheads, a lot of times the engine wouldn't even be stopped running. They'd pull the plug and people were reaching down there to, to turn the engine over because, number, you know, number one, the springs, they didn't want to compress them, but um, the metal that the flathead valves were made of, you know, it was, if, if especially if the exhaust valve was left open, the engines were tilted forward, and if it was left open, it, that straight pipe would, you know, air would, cold air would come in there and would cause the valves to warp or cause the seats to warp. The same thing can happen in overhead valves, it's just not as prone because the valves aren't as long. They're made of a little different metal. Um, but, you know, you want to keep cold air out, especially when the engine's not running. You want to keep everything sealed up and you want to keep your springs, you know, not compressed and they'll last a, a lot longer. You know, people that, they used to change springs at the track. They tell me, man, these springs ain't worth nothing, man. I have to change them at the track. You know, I have to put in a new set for a brace and I feel them, you know, it, run, it runs the whole race, but getting there, you know, I, I feel the RPMs drop off from, from one practice to another and after qualifying. And, I, you know, are you putting on a compression stroke? No. And I explain this to them, and it, it rings a bell. You know, they're like, well, duh, no wonder. Cause they're, and they started rolling it over, and springs would last a couple of races. And you know, this is people turning engines, you know, 68, 6900. Um, just a tidbit for making these springs last longer. I know they're, they're fairly inexpensive, but still, that's money you don't have to spend with just a few seconds of your time to turn it on the compression stroke. Um, uh, carburetors, lash, air filter. All right, now I get a lot of questions about cleaning engines. And there's a lot of people that disagree with what I say, um, but I don't care. This is my show. I say what I want to. You need to believe me or not. Um, I've been doing this for quite a while and um, never had a problem with it. It's done correctly about washing engines with water. I do it every weekend. I don't care what kind of engine it is. My big 390, my box stocks, methanol engines, gas engines, plate engines. Um, I wash them with soap and water. Uh, what you got to do, first of all, take the clutch off of it. We had a lot of people, when the mongrels and all first come out, and even you know with the max torques and all, they buy a clutch, and a couple weeks later, they're calling again, buying another one, saying it tore up. And I'm like, send the clutch back to me get it back to me and it's full of rust. I mean, it's like you're sitting in a bucket of water. And I ask them, do you wash it with a clutch on there? Yeah. Well, I'll crank it up afterwards and let the water spin out of it, but it still gets down into places. But take the clutch off of it. I don't care what kind of clutch you're running, take the clutch off of it. Take the air filter off. And, you know, you can, a lot of cart shops have these little rubber caps that go over the carburetor. Um, I'll stick one of them on it and then I'll still run duct tape around it. Uh, you know, cover your tack. I get a plastic bag, put it over my steering wheel, tape it up, put a piece of tape over the top of the gas tank lid, and um, like maybe if you've got a, a catch tank on the back that's got a filter on it, I may take it off and cap it up. But just cap up any entrance to the engine, any entrance to your fuel tank, or any electronics. Put bags over them. Spray the sucker down with degreaser or you know tire cleaner. Your personal little mix dish detergent, whatever. Spray it down. You can hand wash it. Wash it out or just spray something on it, let it sit, and rinse it off. Wash your whole go-kart. Um, everything. Um, then after you get done, take the stuff off the carburetor, take the stuff off the gas tank, take, this, take all of the stuff that you stopped the engine up with and fire the engine up. Crank it up. What that's going to do, it's going to, number one, things that move, it's the flywheel and all, it's going to spin the water off of it. And then it's going to build heat in the engine and evaporate the rest of the water. And just in case, you know, the, these exhaust gaskets that we run, whether you run a gasket or whether you run some type of RLV or no gasket at all, whatever, sometimes a little water may leak in. And But the valve's closed if you roll on a compression stroke. And it's going to sit there for a minute or two. It's not going to hurt a thing. When you fire the engine up, if, 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 if it leaks, it's going to blow it out. But... If, if it don't, if you don't fire it up, that water's sitting on that valve. It's going to rust the valve, it's going to rust the seat, and it's going to start leaking. Or if the valve's open, water gets on top of the piston, rust the cylinder, rust the rings. I see it all the time. Nothing wrong with washing the engine with water as long as you fire it up when you get done. Don't just fire it up and let it run. Fire it up 
and let it build a little heat. You ain't got to run for 20 minutes. Just let it run for 30, 45 seconds a minute. You know, bump the throttle. Don't let it sit there and load up. And um, you're doing that for two reasons. Number one, to get the water off of it. And number two, you're heating your oil up so that you can change it um, and get ready for the next race. Um, that's something that, that can help the life of an engine also. All these oils that we got, whether it's our Lucas, you know, or Cool Power, or Thor, or whatever, it's all good oils. It just depends on how you want to use it and what you're using it for. They're all good oils. They, they do their job. They lubricate. They keep the engine cool. Um, but, you know, foreign materials still get in there. You know, these filters, you know, are not automotive quality. They don't stop all the dirt. They just stop the bigger particles. The really, really fine stuff sometimes still gets in gets in your engine or, you know, metal particles out of your engine because this is a splash lube engine, the engine's going to wear. You're going to have metal particles, you know, even you have to look at them with a glass, very minute, whatever, um, is going to be in your oil. And that's why I stress so much about draining the oil while it's hot because that oil is holding all this stuff. It's holding the, what little dirt may get in or what form, uh, Obstacle might be in there, metal shavings, whatever. You shouldn't have any in it, but just in case. Um, anything that's in the oil, whether it's raw fuel or whatever, it's holding it in the oil, and if it, while it's hot, it'll pull it out. Because if you let that oil cool, what's going to happen is those sediments are going to settle on the oil pan on the very bottom. And depending on what kind of oil you use, um, I'm not trying to plug our Lucas here, but it does have a detergent in it that usually don't let that stuff settle. Not, you know, I've seen some stuff that would sell a little bit, but most of the time it would keep it in it. But oils, when they're hot, holds all that stuff, it pulls it out. If you let it cool, most of the time it settles on the oil pan. And after several weeks, you know, you could have a pretty good, you know, uh, um, section of debris down there, whether it be raw fuel, because, you know, fuel does get down in the oil and all, but um, always drain it hot. So when you get done washing the engine with water, no problem with it. Just fire it up, let it build a little heat, let it get the oil. It ain't got to be red hot. Just as long as you're mixing the oil up real good and getting a little heat in it, shut it off, put it on compression stroke, drain your oil, um, fill it back up. The engine, minus you know, checking the lash and stuff like that, is ready to go for the next week. Um, two birds, one stone there. Fire it up, let it run, drain your oil. At the racetrack, you know, most times you drain your oil hot anyway, so you're just doing its job there. But it's when it sits overnight that it can cause a problem. Um, also, um, sometime during the next week, uh, after you get done, you need to just go over a few torque specs. I mean, you retorque the head, make sure the head's okay. When you're doing, you're checking your lash sometime during the week, get your torque wrench, set it to 220, wherever you set your head bolts at, just check them. Side cover bolts, don't hurt to check them, you know, 200 inch pounds or whatever. You know, just check little stuff like that there and there. You know, don't hurt to check stuff like that at the races too. You know, sometimes the side covers, you know, I got a little wrench usually I keep in my pocket or my toolbox that you know, I reach up there and just kind of, you know, check stuff periodically here and there. And um, just kind of making sure things stay tight and stay where they need to be. Um, something else I was going to do. But... Little things like that, you know, it's, it's, it's not hard, it's, it's not a lot of stuff, um, fairly simple. You know, some people, I will go back to the washing thing, some people use um, you know, car cleaner on the engine, they'll spray the engine, wipe it down, spray it and wipe it. It gets it clean, I will admit, it, you know, it'll knock all that dirt and grease off of it, but it turns things colors after a while. You'll see, you know, the side cover and your decals and all, they'll start to fade, look fade looking, the block will look, you know, kind of washed out, you know, but um, it'll clean it up and there's nothing wrong with doing that either. The problem I have with carb cleaner on that is actually spraying it on the car because, you know, you got all your little stuff up here and you got your little gaskets back there. You spray that carb cleaner on it, it's going to get on those gaskets, it's going to turn them hard and they're going to get kind of brittle. And could possibly cause them to leak down the road. Um, but there again, you know, checking that stuff periodically will help prevent that. Um, nothing wrong with cleaning up a car cleaner, but just you got to watch out for stuff like that. Um, they get down in there and kind of fade stuff out and turn gaskets hard and this, that, and the other.
Um, I've got a few loaded questions here. Let me go back and start. Oh, God, i got a bunch of questions here. Hello, hello, hello. How y'all? Um, rubber tip on the needle. I've always... Um... Yeah, that, uh, Michael, the, the little rubber thing on the float right here. I'll tell you always talking about Michael's asking about the rubber thing on the, the little needle on the float here. It's got a, it's got a rubber tip on it. Um, I've actually just threw it across the room. <laughs> I just it hit me in the head. Anyway, um... It's got a little rubber tip right here on it that, that seals it off. And other than that oxygenated gas that I use, I've never really had a big problem with it. Um, it is a soft rubber, um, but like I say, uh, with your WD-40, that's when you spray it up into the carburetor and take the bowl off. You know, if you go spray it beside the, you know, where the float goes in, it'll get up there on it. Or you know, you can take your line off and fill this up and run down through it, but you know, it wouldn't hurt to, you know, like I say, spray it up around the, uh, where's it at? right here, around the uh, little needle on it. Because, like I say, that is rubber, but I haven't, I haven't had any real issues with it other than the oxygenated gas. Um, it actually ate it away. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it eat it up. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. You know, wouldn't hurt to spray on that. So anything that's rubber, WD-40 is going to help it, um, help it maintain. Uh, Artie, uh, the jets, especially on the clone carburetor, when you spray on this side, I know this is backwards, but right here's the low. It works the low-speed jet. When you spray it on this side, what it does is it sprays and it goes down into the jet, and you'll see it shoot up the e-tube in the middle. So it's actually cleaning out the main jet when you spray it in this side, and this side is cleaning out the low-speed jet and the welch holes in the back. So that's that's cleaning all that out and lubricating the jets and everything too. Chicago, good to have you, South Dakota. Oh, I'm spreading out there, Anna. So dripping is bad for the filter. That's according to what's dripping off of it, Sam. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, people are answering each other here. Good deal. Springs on twins. Oh, uh, that's a good question there, Don. Um, there is Don, and I got a spot on my thing. My son's been playing with my uh, tablet here. Springs on a twin. Um. When you shut one side down, the other one's going to stay open. Um, run good springs. That's all I can tell you on that. Same thing with a car. V8, there's no possible way to stop the engine with all the springs closed. Um, same thing on a twin. Um, why you got to bring stuff up like that, man? You know, we ain't talking about twins here. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, just if you got to run good springs on that because there's no possible way to stop them with them closed. Not even close. Depending on what kind of cam you run, but um, um, that what I say about the compression stroke thing really doesn't go with twins. Most of the time, people running those are running modified type stuff, so they're running really good springs anyway. Yeah, Wayne, that's like I was just saying, a V8. There's no way to stop it. Um, David Simpson. I'm not gonna say anything. I'm gonna let that go. <laughs> um, there's a few people that's missing tonight that usually gets up here and says something. Will a 615 car from ARC run with 1628 jets in it? Sam, the only way those jets are going to work is for the stock air box. Um, that, you know, like on a Predator, you know, they run the box stock Predators or factory stock, whatever they want to call it. Um... 1628 is probably that's that's completely stock jets. That's usually what comes in them somewhere in that area. That would be the jets you'd run probably with a um completely stock engine, untouched airbox, and probably a stock exhaust. 
Uh, most of the engines that run right here are allow you to want run the uh, little weenie pipe. And typically we go up to about an 18, sometimes we run a 16, but most of the time we go up to about an 18, 29 jet if you can run a weenie pipe. But um, yeah, they'll, they'll run with that in it. Anyway, now I thought I'd have some people that said they was going to come on here and shoot the breeze, but um, so where is that? Oh, that's that scanner. Anyway, um, basic maintenance. It's, it's, uh, helps things last longer, helps things run better and keeps problems from happening. Um, that's like we're running a little too much fuel after cleaning up to show the breeze. Um, Pre-mixed fuel, like putting oil in the fuel. Um, a lot of, some people do that. Um, well, some people use methanol and they'll run like a two cycle oil in it, like designed for methanol two cycle and um, do it that way. But you still have methanol left over that can the oil, you know, where to separate in the engine. Um, as long as long as you're not letting it sit for, um, you know, a month at a time, the premix would probably work just fine. It'll clean things out and loop things up and get ready to go the next time you find. If you let it sit for, you know, longer than a couple of weeks, two weeks, three weeks, a month, um, I'd put something a little, a little more lasting in there. But that should work okay. And there it goes. Appreciate that, Sam. Um, I was kind of hoping I'd get through the night without um, the oil drain plug coming up. But, um, it, um, man, why you had to mention that? I mean, really? I thought we were friends, you know? Fellow Seminole and stuff. But, uh, since he brought it up, um, I guess I'll go ahead and tell the ones that don't know. Um, I went last weekend um, over to uh, Robling Road over in Savannah and had run my first road race over there. Um, some um, That's some good racing over. For those that had never done enduro-style road racing or even sprint racing, um, if all you've ever done is round track, I highly recommend you try turning left and right. Um, it is it's fun. It's, it's never dull. You're always up on the wheel, and then the laps go by very, very quickly. You know, over there, we're running 80-plus, you know, going into the first corner on basically AKRA engines. And, um, well, actually, they are AKRA engines. They'll, they'll pass AKRA tech anywhere in the country. They're, but, you know, we run such tall gear. It takes us a little while to get going, and once we get going, we move them. And it's, um, it, it's, it's, got a pucker factor a little different than what dirt racing does. But um, we went over there and practiced on Friday. Done good. Um, you know, got to kind of pat myself on the back a little bit. I, you know, I think we've done pretty good over there. Um, but Sunday, we raced, we practiced Friday, raced Saturday, and we raced Sunday. Um, Sunday, we made a very big <laughs> rookie mistake. Um, I'm sitting here telling you all all this about, you know, post-race maintenance and what to do during the week and what to check and what to torque. And after we changed the oil in the engine on um, the day before, uh, me or the guy helping me won, I'm going to say it was both of us, it was neither one individually, we left the oil plug, the drain plug loose. We didn't tighten it back up. Because the way you have to change the oil on these engines, you have to actually unhook it on the bottom and pick it up and tilt it forward because they sit flat and there's these, you, you got uh panels and plates that run under, you know, uh, uh, air valves that goes under the go-kart, and there's no way to drain the oil. You have to pick the engine up and tilt it forward and hold it up in the air, and it's kind of aggravating, but it's what you got to do. I'm looking at working on something to try and help do that a little better, but anyway, we just checked everything, but we didn't check the oil plug. Got the engine back on, got the engine tight, got the oil in it. Um, everything we thought was good. Um, Sunday, we just, we, we really dropped the ball. Because um, I was leading the race, leading my class, and leading the overall class of four cycles, well, the class that we was with. You know, they run 
several different classes at one time, but we was leading the class, and um, oil plug came out, and don't care what oil you're running, she's not going to run long that way. Luckily, I got it, I felt it slowing down, I felt the, seen the head temp going up, so I pulled the plug wire off, just as it was locking up, it was fixing to throw the rod out the front, but luckily we saved the engine, and like I say, we dropped the ball. Um, but Saturday, you know, was a good day. Um, I'll say that Saturday we was we was on the ball Saturday. Um, you know we uh, we won our class. Uh, actually, me me and the guy I built engines for we run we both run first and second overall, but we also won our class. I won the light class. He won the heavy class. He won the heavy class on Sunday, but we run first and second um, overall on Saturday and had a really really good day. You know, but I'm not. Gonna come on here and you know it, it was it was like it was a good day, my first ever road race. You know I was proud of what we done, proud that you know we went over and had a good show and our engines done good when they had oil in them. Um, but Saturday was real good. Not gonna really come on here and brag about it. I'm not one to brag or boast. You know I just kind of let things go and be what they be. But um. Anyway, um, done good, and um, kind of proud of what we're doing over there. Like, um, I like that kind of racing real good, a, a lot. I'm planning on going back in, I think the next race is in September that I'm going to be able to go to in Atlanta. But if y'all ain't never, never road race, never sprint race, never turned right on on uh, on purpose, as I tell people, it's the first time I've turned right on purpose. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, they got a clone class, they got an LO206 class, they got an animal class, a lot of two-cycle classes. There's something there for pretty much everybody. It's, it's a whole lot of fun. But again, Sam, uh, thank you for bringing that up. And, um, you know, man, that's some good stuff there. Anyway, um, yeah. Back to the topic at hand. Answer some more questions here. Oh, I'm glad you said something about that, Michael. That is something I meant to say about washing the car. Um, it's good. You, know, you can wash the engine, dry it off, yada, yada, yada. But when you wash the rest of the car, be sure as soon as you, you know, dry off the, you know, crank the engine up, fire it up, yada, 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 take the, the uh, dust caps off of your uh, bearings on the, on the front and the rear and clean them out with car cleaner and re-lube them. Um, you don't want them to sit with water in them. That is one thing that, you know, a lot of people, that's why they stay on me about, don't tell people to wash go carts with water. It's fine to wash it with water as long as you clean the stuff out. Take the dust caps off your bearings, um, clean them with carb cleaner or whatever your normal procedure is, lube them, whatever you normally lube them with, because you don't want that stuff to sit. You want them good and clean and so they, you know, don't have any problems down the road. <laughs> There's one of my road race guys right there. Yeah, um, one thing about that crew, that I really enjoyed racing with all these guys. Everybody over there, whether it's in my class or not, a good group of people. Um, the late racing is so laid back. I felt the whole weekend I, sh I was supposed to be doing something. I was supposed to be washing tires. I was supposed to be doing this or doing that. Basically, you go out on the track, you check your air pressure, you come in, you sit around and hang out. And it's time for your race again. You check the air in your tires, and you go back out. You one set of tires all weekend. It's great. Um, but I will say that it's a diverse group of comedians, which I fit in with very well. And um, but they they like making decals and sticking them on your cart and sticking them on your helmet and not tell you about it. And you go to the drivers' meeting and everybody sees these decals on your helmet. Um, they pulled one over on me. They got me good, which which. It's good that they've done that because after the engine tore up, I'm kind of bummed out. I'm like, because once I figured out what was going on, I looked down and there's oil all in the floor pan and, and everything. And I figured, I realized what we'd done. And I said, well, this ain't good. And this don't look good for us and all. But I pushed the car over to the side and was waiting on the little trolley cart to come pick us up. Took my helmet off and 
we're wiping the oil off of it. Notice on the back, they put a decal. I ain't really going to talk about what it says, but it made me laugh and really it, it, it made my day. It, it was good, but paybacks are, are pretty rough for me. So um, you never know when, you never know how, um, but Steve, did they, they, they going to pay for it. They're going to pay for it a lot, you know, but. It don't matter. They can put all the decals they want to on my helmet, all the decals they want to on my cart. I got me a nice beer drinking cup. Ah. Victory tastes sweet. But, um, let's go back to some uh, <laughs> show off. Tommy, number one, I, one thing I don't do, I don't openly brag. Um, I may cut the fool with some of my friends that are on here. Y'all, Everybody on here is my friends. We... I like to cut up and all, but but I'm the people that really know me. I I'm humble about every win I've ever got, you know, because it's been it's been a while since I've won a national race. You know, that was a national uh, event. It's been a long time since I won a national event. I mean, you know, and I'm 40 years old, so I ain't got a whole lot of racing left in me. But um, I'm I'm thankful for every win from go karts to legend cars to, to dirt late models, asphalt late models, the truck that I drove it. I'm humble for everything I've ever gotten. I just, I like cutting up with people, you know, especially, you know, the ones that pulled the trick on me, you know, they were in my class, you know, my first ever race, you know. <sighs> Almost out. i got to get a refill. But, um, yeah, I, I usually don't brag about stuff like that. You know, it's not a good look. Belt-driven torque converters. Um, depends on what kind of belt-driven torque converter it is. Um, some of the belts out there, torque converters, like the ones they use in junior dragsters and stuff like that, are really, really good, but they're really, really, really expensive. Um, these Chinese ones depends on how it's made and what type of engine you're putting it on. I don't recommend those cheap Chinese ones for, you know, modified engines. They're just not going to hold up. If you need a belt drive for some type of modified engine, I highly recommend um, getting in touch with some of these junior drag guys and, and, and paying for one. Like these mini uh, mini bike guys, they run torque converters. Um, they run good ones though. Um, get, in, get in contact with some of them and I don't I don't deal with them. We used to. Um, I don't deal with torque converters myself so I really don't know what to tell you on them. Just being honest. But I can tell you who to go to. Um, you know, check out some of those mini bike guys. They, they, they got their stuff right. They, they know what's going on. Not Gerald, I, I really can't tell you what it said, man. This is this is yeah. this is a business side. I mean, I'll I may message you later with it. I don't know. I, I may, I may not. Um, it's kind of a bunch of bunch of inside jokes to begin with that most people wouldn't understand. Um, some folks might find it offensive, so I'm just gonna kind of keep that to myself. And um, it was good though. It was good, which made my day. You know, I. I it's, it's good racing with people like that that, you know, when you have a bad day, they can they can um, turn it around just by something simple as that, you know, and it, it was good. Do I run a magnet in the drain plug? I don't. Um, I'm not saying it's not a bad idea, you know, but, you know, because everything in the engine, inside the engine, uh, there's a lot of steel in there. You know, you got the crankshaft, you got the cam, you got the lifters. Um, you know, and you could see little problems like that, you know, but I don't run one. Um, I wish I'd have seen it coming out. I would have reached down there with my hand and held it in, you know, and, or at least tried to plug the hole with my finger or something. I probably had third degree burns on my finger when I come back, but I have two beer cups, you know, but, um, actually to show y'all what I've done, my son, which is fixing to turn three next week, he's a big he loves the movie. He's got several movies that he likes. Of course, Minions. He wears that Minion hat all the time. But he loves cars. His bed, his room in there, his bed, and all is decorated with Lightning McQueen and stuff like that. And um, when I won the trophy, they brought I me. Mean, I brought her over and we took pictures with it, put it on the website and yada yada yada. And first thing he said is, "Ooh, a piston cup." You know, because cars, the trophy in there is called a piston cup. So what I done is I come home and I've got a. Just to let you guys know that Road Race um, that put the stickers on there, I've got a vinyl machine also. So just keep that in mind. Because I know it's going to be backwards, but I come home and broke. 
christening cup on it. And it sits in his room now up on a shelf. And, you know, when people come over now, his, his friends or grandma or whatever, granddaddy, he can take him in there and show him his very own christening cup. Of course, you know, the other side still says, you know, WK National Winter on it, you know. But that's none of my business. Anyway, I thought that was cool to do for him, and he enjoyed it. You know, he got him a piston cup now. But um, I actually bent the. If you if you bent a torque converter, if you got something that'll you know <laughs> light the tires up on the road, you're gonna need a really good torque converter. <laughs> you're gonna have to pay for that. Um. You know, a good clutch, even these good, you know, the clutches that we got on the market now, um, they won't hold up to that very long. Um, you're going to have to have something really, really good. Um, go back through some of these questions here. Dang, I'm, on, I'm basically done, and it's only been an hour. We're getting them, we're getting them shorter, y'all. We're getting them shorter. All right, well, if we ain't got no more questions... Um, I'll just go over a few things that, you know, we've been working on at the shop. Um, of course, always working on stuff. Um, looking at a couple of new products. I know I've been saying this for a while, but we've just been so busy with other stuff. It's hard, it's hard to get on a product and stay on it from start to finish with us because we have so many other things going on. You know, because carding is only a part of what we do. You know, we have other contracts and all that we do. But um, it's hard to get on stuff and stay on it. But we got a couple of products that's hopefully, hopefully, um, it's back. It's back to me again. You know, they'll we'll, we'll design something, we'll make something, we'll test some stuff in house. Then it comes to me to do the dyno testing on. Then it either works or it doesn't, and it goes back to the you know the shop to have some more changes on. It, and it's back to me for dyno testing, and that's it's back to me now to dyno test this stuff. And then I track test it. You know, once the dyno says it's good. Then it goes to the track, and um, but we got a few things coming out. Um, we're working on stuff, working really hard. Um, we um, I'm looking. I really shouldn't tell you all that, but I'm looking. I'm gonna tell you anyway. At doing some shirts, some t-shirts. I get a lot of people, a lot of people that want shirts. The problem I have with shirts is the same problem that everybody else in the business has with shirts. Um, people want you to give them to them. <laughs> That's something that, you know, if I do shirts, I, you know, may do a discount shirt, you know, if you buy an engine or something like that, but we're looking at doing t-shirts, you know, and possibly putting them on the website, or it might be something I do, you know, on the side, outside of the website. Either way, we're looking at it. I ain't giving you a definite yes or a definite no, um, but we're looking into it if the interest is there. Um, you know, if we do them, they'll be a single color. You know, they'll have our logo and stuff on the front, but it'll be a gray shirt or a black shirt or something like that. But do maybe adult small through extra large right now. Um, kind of start small and work our way up. Um, I know we could probably sell as many as I want to get, but I just don't want to make a big investment in it and they sit on the shelf. But um, that is something we're working on doing, you know, trying to get them, some shirts out there for the people that want them. Um, they'd be somewhere between... You know, ten, twelve dollars, something like that. And right now, shirts would all we we would do um, if they work good, and we keep doing them through the summer, maybe the winter months. We'll look at some, you know, some hoodies, you know, or some beanies or something like that. But just some of the things we're working on. Um, always working on, you know, trying to reach people. You know, which is why I'm doing this, thinking about taking this to the next level with something else. We've been, I've kind of talked about it with you know, my wife and stuff like that, because I do this at my house. Um, but trying to reach the people, trying to do more, you know, marketing and helping and, you know, whatever we can do. But um, the stuff we're working on and trying to make trying to make it, you know, our, our, our business as best we can for our customers. Because our customer base is is us. That's, that's all we got is our customer base and our reputation. But anyway, um, appreciate everybody joining in tonight. Um, God, there's always one more when I'm trying to get off. Uh, how many RPMs is safe to turn on a stock 
Predator. 3,600 RPM. That's what those flywheels are designed to turn. Anybody that knows anything about products that have centrifugal force on them knows that those flywheels are not designed to turn over 36, 3,800 RPMs. Number one, they're cast iron. Cast does not like to flex. Cast is one of those, it's, it's rigid and then it breaks. Um, a lot of people run them. A lot of people have been lucky with them. I've seen several break happen too. A guy sent me a picture back end of the year that he bought a new engine from Harbor Freight, took it out the box, set it on his go-kart just to crank it up and didn't do nothing to it. He put oil in it, put gas in it, had a stock tank on it, stock air box, stock exhaust. Put it on his cart, was going to fire it up and let it, you know, break in a little bit. He fired it up, it run for five minutes, and the, and the flywheel, it wasn't even running hard, it was like 2,000 RPM, and the flywheel broke. It come in half and went out the side of his shop. He had the pictures of it in his truck. Um, but the way those flywheels are made, of course they're round, <laughs> but the sides, the inside of it is hollow. Um, there's nothing in there to stop the sides from when the thing's spinning around, because the flywheel is going to want to try to flex out. That hollow side is going to try to turn out. And what that, when that does, it, it, it'll break it in the middle. Um, but there's nothing in there. You know, If you look at our billet flywheel, and the one time I don't have one here. But the way ours and other billet flywheels are made, there's the thick, there's a thicker on the back, and it holds the flywheel from expanding out. It actually, the whole thing tries to come out instead of that outside coming out. But that stock one... It'll flex. Well, it tries to flex. Like I said, cast iron don't flex. It, it, it's there, and then it breaks. The biggest problem they have with them is the little magnets coming off of them. When you look at them, they're held on that little, little piece of metal on the top, and there's a single wood screw that goes through the middle of it and some glue. What happens is when you spin them up four or 5,000, that piece of metal that covers the magnet straightens out. And when it straightens out, it comes up and it catches the coil, breaks the coil and the magnet off of it. Either that or the magnet itself, if you put a bigger coil gap in the magnet itself, eventually when that thing stretches out so much, it breaks off. And people say, oh, it's just a magnet coming off. That thing is spinning 5,000 RPMs. When it comes off, it's running probably the same speed as a 45 ACP. I don't want to get in front of one of them. I definitely want to get in front of that big magnet flying across there at 800 feet per second. Um, it can cause some damage. I've seen holes in people's shops that the magnet themselves left in them, but I know that was a long, drawn-out thing. All I had to say was the RPM, but I wanted to give you a reason why. They're not designed to turn over 3,600 RPM. They just, the way they try to flex, and it causes problems. A lot of people run them, but a lot of series say you got to run them, and they turn them engines, you know, 52, 5300. It's just a matter of time. I hate to say it. I really hate to say it. I don't want to see anybody get hurt. The last thing I want to do is see somebody get hurt. But... Just like in some other series, that's what it took to make a change. You know, I, I, I don't want people to think I'm trying to push flywheels. I'm not trying to push ours. I'm not trying to push any other billet flywheels out there. They're all fine products. Ours are fine products. There's some really nice billet stuff out there. But I'd rather them buy stuff from our, our competitors to put on these engines and take them stock ones off because when I, I just don't want some kid to be standing by an engine or standing by the fence or somebody getting past and a flywheel blow up and hurt or possibly worse, kill somebody. I don't want that. And these series don't understand. I mean, not saying they don't understand, but the, the repercussion on that man can be, it, it could not only will somebody get really bad hurt or even killed, it could completely ruin the sport. You know, because back when some of them flathead flywheels blew up back in the day, I know somebody personally that has a scar on the side of his face, and I think the flywheel is still at the shop. That one, a, a flathead flywheel blew up on the dyno. Changed his life forever. And someone got killed at a race, you know, back in the 90s uh, with a flathead flywheel blowing up. Back then, they didn't have the Internet, and everybody didn't have Facebook in their back pocket. Today, unfortunately, the way the mentality is, when something happens, if there's a fight, if somebody gets shot, somebody gets run over, or a flywheel comes off and takes half of somebody's head off, the first thing people do is this. They get their phone out. Oh, look at this. I'm going to be a celebrity on Facebook. 
or I'm going to be a YouTube sensation. I'm going to be, they're going to look at my videos and I'm going to be somebody. I don't know why people do that. That that burns me up when I see videos of people fighting in a parking lot and they're sitting here like this. Instead of calling the cops, they're videotaping. World star, world star. Well, world star is something else. But that's what's going to happen. Something's going to happen and it's going to be all over the internet in 30 minutes. It's going to be viral. And that's going to be bad for the sport. It's going to be bad because, you know, that's when government gets involved, you know, lawyers and this, that, and the other, and that's really going to be really bad for the sport. Um, don't know why I went into all that. I guess that's a rant of mine that I had to do. It, it just, I don't understand why they, I don't, they're trying to save money. They're trying to say, you know, it's a stock engine, you know, they got a $150 claimer on it. Why buy a $100 flywheel for it? Well, let the flywheel go in a claimer. If somebody gets claimed, take the flywheel off. Problem solved. <laughs> you know, they can get their own flywheel or add a hundred dollars or eighty bucks or whatever to the to the uh, claimer so that they can take the flywheel with them. It's safety, people. It ain't about pushing a product. It ain't about my bottom line. It's about it's about the bottom line is I don't want nobody to get hurt. Plain and simple. Thirty six hundred RPMs, that's all they designed to turn. And like Forrest Gump says, that's all I got to say about that. I think I'm out of breath, huh? Need to quit ranting like that. Yeah, look right here. Wayne broke one on a blue Chinese engine turner a little too hard. Right there. Somebody broke one. And, uh, oh, crankshaft. My bad. I thought he was talking about a flywheel. I guess I need to start reading before I go off on a rant. There's Pops from Detroit. I talk to Pops on the phone all the time. He's a good guy. Sounds pretty intelligent. Sounds like he's got they got some pretty bad machines up there. Glad to see y'all here, Pops. Colorado. All right, now I'm going to try this one more time to to end this. And like always, I'll put it on Facebook and YouTube. Yeah, we got a YouTube channel, too, for those that don't know. All these videos that I do, they're on our Facebook page. Some of them with the technical stuff is on our web page, but all of them, whether it's the technical videos I've done about the flywheels, um, the one I've done on the, on the connecting rod, or any of these live, they all go... Uh, on our YouTube channel, ARC Racing, so you can always see them there. And um, with that, I'm going to tell everybody, appreciate you tuning in tonight, and possibly, not promising two weeks, I know I used to do them every, every other week, I'm not promising that, I'm going to try, but it's probably going to be, you know, a few weeks longer before I get to do nothing until I get caught up with some stuff, but anyway, um, Bill Jackson sent me a message, and his face is right in front of the button I need to push to get off here. Um, not sure what the next show's about. Right now, I'm trying to get Bill Jackson's face off my screen. Appreciate it, Bill. Ah, oh, crap. What did I do? There it went. You messed me up there, Bill. Thank you. Uh, anyway, appreciate y'all tuning in. Uh, I'll let y'all know when the next show happens. And um, got any questions, concerns? Uh, shoot me a message on here. Uh, toll free number 800-521-3560 or shoot me an email at jody at arcracing.com. Appreciate it. See y'all next time, man. Thank y'all.